Okay guys, hi, I'm back. Okay, so today is going to be a part four of some interesting things that I found and I'm going to share my hypothesis about what I think about what I think these things are and also my hypothesis on why I think there should be gold, silver and precious stones excavation or mining or panning in this in this country okay again this is my hypothesis again you can't build you honestly cannot build a hypothesis using Google Earth you need more advanced uh, capabilities to map out what's actually there and to prove that these structures are not just anomalies and also you need excavations and geologists to actually go down there and test and test these things Okay, so again, like I said, today is my hypothesis on what I think these structures are in Trinidad and also that I think that Trinidad has gold, potentially silver, and other precious stones. And I'm going to show you why. Okay, so we're going to look at, this is Google Earth, and this is a 3D imaging of Scotland Bay again and what's interesting about this Google Earth is that it allows me to do 3D imaging and when I did the 3D imaging it's really ironic what this structure begins to look like it begins to take shape like a, a sphinx I'm not saying that it is I'm just saying that at some angles that's what it looks like it looks like a pyramid in the background and a sphinx that's guarding it that's just what it looks like to me. Again, you're going to need more uh, professional um, expertise and professional excavation of this area to prove this hypothesis, okay? And again, you know, it's like all great, all great um, inquiries started with a hypothesis or a theory or some ancient myth or some lore and people go in search of finding these things, okay? So I'm not crazy for doing this there's a lot that's discovered because of some ancient myth and one of the ancient myths was that there was a city called El Dorado and um, in South America well somewhere in the Caribbean actually or possibly South America and I was always taught that Columbus and his merry band of crooks um, never really paid any attention to Trinidad but then I was researching and I discovered that that was a mistake. Actually, Sir Walter Raleigh, in search of El Dorado in Trinidad, rediscovered, because he didn't discover it, he rediscovered the Pitch Lake, the Asphalt Lake, one of the largest asphalt lakes in the world, which is located in Trinidad. Now, we're going to take a quick look at this, and we're going to look at some other objects as well. And I'm going to make this, I'm going to make this really quick. Okay. Now. Some reason it's not letting me do it. Ah, there we go. Okay, so this at some angles this begins to look like a sphinx, right? Look at this. Okay, let's see if we can pull this top. Look at this. The paws and then a giant structure in the back, and this is where we see that pyramid structure. So I'm beginning to think that this face is the shadow of what's up here at a specific angle of the sun hitting it. So I'm thinking that the sun would have to hit this at um, west. That would be west because I've changed the whole map. The sun would have to hit it west and then it produces the shadow of a face and the shadow of a face could be a sphinx. Now, I might again, I might be wrong. This is just hypothesis. Okay, and again, you would have to have professionals actually go there with professional equipment, whether it's satellite or ground penetrating radar or geologists on the ground, who knows, to take a look at this. Okay, so this, this, object that we're, this object where we see a face, I'm beginning to wonder if this face is the shadow of an actual sphinx guarding the pyramid, right? And that's one of the things I wanted to show you. 
But here's what I think is really peculiar. I began to look at this, right? And one of my viewers said to me, Renetta, if you look above this king's head, there is a script. There is a script written. And what's interesting is that you can clearly see there's some sort of script that's written here, all across here, going all the way up here, okay? And this, what does this look like? In the biblical lore, it speaks about this star, and this six-sided star, one, two, three, four, five, six. And I find it really peculiar that some forest, some jungle trees produced a star. Guys, anyone can go there on Google Earth and they can find this. There's a star and there's some sort of script written here. And what's also interesting, look at this. Columbus, when he came across the northern part of Trinidad, and he got to this region, let me just show you, okay, when he got to this region, so this is the north, so he came across here, he and his merry band of cr criminals, he came across here, and he called this region Bocas del Dragon, this whole region he called the mouth of the dragon. Guys, get where I'm going with this. So I'm looking at this, and I decided to pan out, guys, do you see what I'm seeing? What does this look like? Doesn't this look like a, the mouth of a crocodile? What I find interesting is that Columbus names this area Bocas del Dragon. And it so happens that, look at the symmetry of the eyes of the crocodile. Okay, now this could all be a coincidence. All of the script, the face that looks like a king, the stargazer, the other stargazer, the two creatures holding the stargazer up on something, this star above them, you know, you have a stargazer looking into a telescope and there's a star. Am I the only, guys, look at this. Am I the only person seeing this? Look at this. There's a stargazer. He's looking through a telescope, and there's a star. Then you have another stargazer looking through some type of advanced telescope. And what's interesting about this is that this looks like an actual hieroglyph. Now, I was looking at hieroglyphs. I was going through all sorts of languages because at first I said, this looks like a bee, a star. I couldn't make out what is this. And then I was like, lechem? Lechem, L-E-H-M. You see it? L-E-H-M. I'm like, Bech, this is a B. Lechem, and there's a star? I'm like, Bethlehem? But then I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, if that's Bethlehem, that would have to be Latin. A Latin transliteration of ancient Hebrew. Because the Hebrews would not have written it with this script. The Arabs would not have written it with this script. This would have had to have been Roman. But then, this doesn't look like a Roman. This king doesn't look like a Roman. This king looks like a pharaoh wearing, you know, the, one of those. It's not a mitre he's wearing. It's one of those, um, they're called... Um, the big skulls, the one with the big, the elongated skulls, one of his pharaonic crowns that looks like uh, the elongated skulls. I forgot what they call them. Okay? Um, to cover the elongated head. So that's what this looks like. Or it can even look like a Mesoamerican, either Mayan or Incan or Aztec king. So I'm saying Be-Be-Lechem, because this looks like L-E-H-M. I'm like Be-Lechem. I'm like Bethlehem? And what's interesting about Bechlehem or Bechlehem 
is that we know that there was a prophecy about a star rising in the east. But this is not east, this is west. So I'm like, no, maybe I'm, I'm reading the script. Maybe I'm reading the script wrong. So I, de I decided that um, I, maybe I should look at ancient Egyptian. And that's when it hit me. Some of the script here, and I'll show you where else, they look Egyptian. And what I also found to be interesting was that this mountain happens to be shaped after an Egyptian god. Let's look at this. The Egyptians worshipped Soshet, Soshet or Sobek. And this is what Sobek, this is what Sobek looks like. This is a carving of Sobek. Okay, so I'm like, can you see? And I find it really ironic that the two dark shades, which I'm thinking are probably caves, and the dark shading around it produced a giant crocodile. And next to the giant crocodile is an image of someone who looks like he can be a pharaoh. And next to the pharaoh, there's a stargazer. And above the stargazer, you see a giant star. And above the star, there's a script that I can't make out. I All I'm seeing is like a mechem. And what's, what's ironic about this, so we see here this mountain that's shaped like a crocodile. A king, whether he's Aztec, Mayan, or Incan, or Pharaonic. We see two stargazers, and then we see two creatures holding up here, holding up the stargazers, right? Then we go here. And doesn't this kind of look like the face of the woman? Doesn't this look like the Sphinx? Like a Sphinx? Because we know this is a some sort of pyramidal structure because we looked at it, we saw it, right? Let's let's do a 3D um let's look at this. Look at this. Bocas del Dragon. Dragon. What's a dragon? A dragon was a dinosaur, a fire-breathing dinosaur. A dinosaurs of the prehistoric era today are crocodiles, are snakes. I just find this whole thing. And then it so happens that the mountain just happens to look like Egyptian gods. What's also interesting, so let's let's just turn this, let's just turn this back. What's also interesting is that I looked up, and I'm gonna be quick with this. saved it but uh, ah found it guys look at this look at this image I'm showing you look carefully at this image that I'm showing you look at this image this is ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs look at this image that I'm showing you okay now watch this
Look at this. One, two, three, four, five. Look at this. Look at this. One, two, three, four, five. Look at this. Now look at this. It could be nothing. But then when you look at the whole picture, what do we see? We see a man wearing a headdress. He has a face, he has a body, there's something on his back. And a lot of times, they would dress like their gods. I don't know what the meaning of this, I don't know what this means. I have no idea what this means. But I just find it ironic that ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, there's this pictograph here. And I just find it ironic that we find the same pictograph here on the headdress of some man and he has something on his back and something in his hand that's kind of like this okay and then we see this this face here and this giant here etched out into the carving of the wall so i wanted to show you that now and here's another face okay now when i turn this look at this what's what i think is really interesting when I turn this object, now we see a face here, right? What looks like a face. When I turn this to the side, doesn't that look like something crash landed in the mountain? I don't know. Again, this is all hypothesis, it's all conjecture. I am not saying anything definitively, but I just think it's really it's really worth looking at. Okay? So that's something I wanted to show you. Now let's close that out and I'm gonna go to a hypothesis that I think is really interesting. And my hypothesis is I think that I think that Trinidad has gold. Now the history of Trinidad, the Colombian history, which is when the criminal cartel of Christopher Columbus and his merry band of criminal crooks came to the Americas, they heard of a city called El Dorado. Okay, The natives told them that there was a lost city of gold named El Dorado and they told them head south so they were coming down the down the archipelago in search of this city now I was taught as a kid that the native the Caribs in Trinidad and the Arawaks told them no you have to get on a boat and go up the Orinoco and go into the dark continent the big continent which is South America and I always speculated to myself I said look the Native Americans in the Caribbean and in Central America, they knew what these conquistadors were about. They were criminals. And I always believed that they lied to them. I believe that El Dorado existed, but I believe that they were trying to get rid of them because they heard the rumors of what they were doing. So they pushed them down south, told them either they made it up or they hid the secret and they, they told them, go south and go look for it so that they'll die in the jungle, okay? That's what I think. And we were taught in the Caribbean that Columbus and his merry band of crooks saw no worth in Trinidad, but they used it as an outpost, a jump off, to go to South America, to go up the Orinoco, and to go into South America in search of gold. I was wrong, because what we discovered about no, what we discovered about one of the places and i'm going to go into that was that they were searching in trinidad what i discovered is they were actually searching in trinidad for el dorado and i'm going to explain that to you in short this is a short video now why would i why would i jump to the conclusion that i think that trinidad has gold 
Trinidad has silver. And I believe, and my instincts are telling me that Trinidad has precious stones like lapis lazuli, uh, emeralds, um, uh, I can't even think of it now, um, diamonds, etc. Well, I had a hunch, and it's my hunch that told me this, but hunch, hunches don't prove anything. So let's, give, let's, let's go into some sort of, um, let's look at some uh, geographic and geological research about this region. Now this is a map of the Andes, okay? The Andes stretches from Chile all the way at the bottom of South America and it goes up and goes across all the way into Venezuela. And that tiny little dot that you see there, that's Trinidad. Now, when we're looking at Trinidad on a map, okay, when we're looking at Trinidad on a map, let me show you the map of Trinidad. Now this region here, this here is Venezuela, and this region here is an extension of that Andes. And it broke off about, they say, 11 to 12,500 uh, years ago. Now I thought it was millions of years ago, but I was wrong. The actual research is 11,000 to 12,500 12, years ago. And this, you were able to cross here, but then some cataclysm occurred, and then it separated Venezuela from Trinidad. This northern region here is the final extension of the Andes. Okay, so let's look at the Andes. The Andes stretches from the bottom of South America, we are Chile, all the way up. It goes across to Venezuela, and it ends in Toco. Okay, that's where it ends. So this is Venezuela, this is the islands, this is the region that we were looking at with these structures, and it goes all across, and this is where Trinidad gets its name, Trinidad, or La Trinité, which is for the three mountainous regions in that area. And it ends in the east at Toco. That is where the Andes ends, okay? So we look at this. This is a map of the Andes. Here's another one, okay? So we're down here, and we're going all the way up. This is the Andes. We go all across Caracas, Venezuela, and it ends in Trinidad, right? So then we look at... Okay, so that's, that's the geography of Trinidad. Another interesting thing, what countries do the Andes Mountains run through? In this, they don't mention Trinidad, but Trinidad is where the Andes ends. We have Venezuela, and I showed you that Venezuela is at some parts 12, 8 to 12 miles, and then at some parts, from where I showed you in the north, it's about 30 miles. So we have Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. And we have to include Trinidad in that, and I will show you that Trinidad is an extent, the northern part of Trinidad is an extension of the Andes, right? The second thing, what is interesting about what is interesting about um, the Andes is that the Andes is known for specific precious metals and precious gems and stones. We're going to go look at this. Again, this is just a hype, my hypothesis, right? Okay. I'm just going to skim through this article really, really quickly. Maybe not, I won't even skim through it because I'm just looking for some facts here. Sorry. Again, this is just a hunch of mine. And you know, you can't make a business decision on a hunch. Okay? South America to the world. Okay. Alright, look at this. Major coal-producing regions in the Andes are found in Colombia, Peru, and to a lesser extent, northern Chile. Many small-scale miners, illegal or informal miners, pursue thin vein nets in most Andean countries. Right? So we have here, 
Most of the historic Andean gold has been sourced from alluvial deposits along river terraces, such as the major gold fields in Madre de Dios jungle of Peru, or the Pacific pediments of Colombia in the departments of Choco and Nariño, and from large-scale deposits belonging to several geological classes. So we know that that region is a gold-producing region. Okay, but it's not just gold that's produced in that in that region. Okay. Okay. Let's let's look at some other things here. Usually not this slow, but whatever. Okay, so let's look at um, this is like. The mining industry of the Andes is one of the most important of the world. Mining is especially extensive in the south. The principal minerals are copper in Chile and Peru, tin in Bolivia, silver, lead, and zinc in Bolivia and Peru, gold in Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia, platinum and emeralds in Colombia, bismuth in Bolivia, vanadium in Peru, and coal and iron in Chile, Peru, and Colombia. Several deposits of petroleum are distributed along the eastern side of the Andes. So we went through the Andes, right? Now what's also interesting about Trinidad, that's the northern part, is we're gonna look at, and look at this, this is Venezuela, before we close out, this is Venezuela, which is about, at some parts, 8 to 12 miles, and then 30 miles close to Trinidad. The Orinoco Arch drops 17 tons of gold into Venezuela's coffers as ecologists question the project. This is Venezuela, and this is the Orinoco Mining Arch, and there's Trinidad. Okay, now if we look at this map, we see that there's a tributary from the gold region of Venezuela that leads you right out to where? Trinidad. Why is that important? Now what's, what's also important to understand is the southern part of Trinidad, as a matter of fact, the whole island because it goes up to like the, the Lesser Antilles, it goes up to like a quarter of the islands, most of the islands actually, in the Lesser Antilles the tributaries that come out of the Amazon, specifically the Orinoco Delta. The Orinoco Delta flows right out into Trinidad, and that is where you get, when you go south, you tend to find different gradations of water. Like when you go up in the regular Caribbean, you, you tend to have crystal clear blue waters. But in Trinidad, the people say, oh, you know, the, the water looks dirty. No, it's not dirty. That's because Trinidad is engulfed from that water coming off of that Orinoco Delta, and that's a high sediment type of water, right? We went, and this is what a map of what the Orinoco flowing into and around Trinidad that produces that, that silt from that, um, from the, that silt and sediment coming out of the Orinoco around Trinidad that produces that color water, okay? So we see here that, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but look at this, when Columbus sailed into the Gulf of Paris, when the Christopher the Crook criminal cartel Columbus sailed, who did not discover anything, because you can't discover somewhere where people already live. That's like me walking to your house and saying I discovered your home, whatever sailed into the Gulf of Paria, he had to make sense of two anomalies. His navigational readings were picking up the Earth's equatorial bulge and the Orinoco being in spate meant that the water was in fact fresh.
fresh. Captivated by the apparently friendly natives, the exuberant vegetation, the benign climate, and the blah, 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 1498, that's when he landed in Trinidad, blah, 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 blah. But the point is, this is the Orinoco Delta that you can literally follow up from the base of Trinidad. What's interesting about the Orinoco Delta? Let's go back to this. That Orinoco Basin is pure gold. It's a gold basin. And what we know is that that Orinoco Delta has gold in it. So we see that the Andean region in the north and the Orinoco Delta, which is at the south of Trinidad, both of them have gold deposits. Okay, so let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. So my hypothesis, my hypothesis is looking at these, looking at the geolocation, the geographic location, now I'm going to say geolocation for short, geographic location of Trinidad and Tobago, and Tobago, there's potentially, there might potentially be gold in Tobago as well. Looking at the geographic location of Trinidad, particularly in north and Trinidad, particularly in the south, I deduce my instincts are telling me there's gold deposits there. Not just gold deposits, but you're looking at other type of precious stones as well. Okay? Um, now, some of the things that you need if you're looking for some of the indicators, okay, rock formations where you may find gold. Some of the rock formations that you may find gold is quartz. Quartz. Now, according to Trinidad, the economic minerals that they have found in Trinidad is andesite, which is in Tobago, argillite, chromium, clay, copper, fluor spar, graphite, gypsum, iron, limestone, porcelainite, sand and gravel, quartz, gravel, quartz, gravel, quartz, gravel. So we see here quartz may be one of the indicators of, of gold, okay? And we see, and I know for a fact, because I remember this intrusive rock, I remember seeing this rock in Trinidad, these rock formations in Trinidad. And this intrusive rock formation is one of the other indicators that they may be gold. Okay, again, this is my hypothesis. Where am I going with this? And I am hypothesizing that in the northern region and in the southern region, depending on where the Orinoco pushes this, where the Orinoco pushes this silt, okay, I am hypothesizing that Trinidad may in fact be a gold economy, a gold producing economy. I'm saying it's a hypothesis. I could be wrong, okay? So we see that some of the um, some of the rock formations for gold, and we see that Trinidad has that. What's also interesting is that we see here, hold on, these are the islands in the Orinoco, hold on, another interesting find is that they were doing research in, I believe, Azerbaijan, okay? In Azerbaijan, they have mud volcanoes. And in the mud volcanoes, I am not saying this definitively, I am saying research that was published on the 26th of April 2018, they discovered that naturally formed gold, silver, iron, copper, titanium, and new minerals have been discovered in Azerbaijan's mud volcanoes for the first time. Why is that important? That is important because Trinidad has mud volcanoes. Okay, does it mean that there's gold? 
and silver and titanium are in and around Trinidad's mud volcano? No. But what I'm saying is, research indicated that they found naturally formed gold, silver, iron, copper, titanium, and other minerals were discovered from Azerbaijan's mud volcanoes. The work on studying the mud volcanoes of Azerbaijan, jointly with Ukraine specialists, is underway for the last two years. Okay, so the research was successful that they carried out. They had 20 mud volcanoes. In each of the volcanoes, naturally formed components containing various amounts of gold, silver, etc. were found. The content of precious metals in mud volcanoes vary between 20 to 60 microns, according to Aliyev. Okay, so this is research, and they were successful in finding gold, silver, copper, titanium, and new minerals in their mud volcanoes. Why is this significant? Trinidad has mud volcanoes. Piparo is a village in Trinidad on the southern edge. Remember I told you about that southern edge with the Orinoco Delta? Okay. On the southern edge of Trinidad's central range lies the small village of Piparo. Okay, or Piparo, that's how they pronounce it, which boasts a few claims to fame. First, it was where Calypso legend, Rash or Tiaidis is Calypso, da 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 da, Dolcini, and the uh, utmost import, the village of Piparo was the site of a bizarre, hugely destructive mud volcano eruption. Mud volcano, okay? That's one. Then there is another one called the Devil's Woodyard. Okay? Does this definitively mean that there is gold in the mud volcano in Trinidad? I'm not saying that. Okay? Okay. Okay, so this is another one. A hydrothermal mud volcano forms in Canopia, Trinidad and Tobago. This is another one. The EMA of Trinidad and Tobago received a report on the 20, uh, 27, 2017 of water and mud bubbling from a hole in the ground in the vicinity of Makaya Trace, Monroe Road, Canopia. So this is another mud volcano that was found, okay? Mud volcanoes are nothing unusual for Trinidad and Tobago. They are, a, they are and are their geological feature. They are frequently found across South and Central Trinidad associated with the Central Range. This is the Central Range going across here. Ford Belt, which are belts of deformed sedimentary rock of rocks are folded and duplicated by thrust faults. The most famous and popular mud volcano in Trinidad and Tobago is the Devil's Woodyard in Piparo. We just saw that one. Okay? And they tell you about the eruption that occurred there. Right? So, we see here that in this region, there are mud volcanoes. So, we see research indicating that they discovered gold, silver, iron, copper, titanium, and new minerals in the mud volcano in Azerbaijan and we see that Trinidad has mud volcanoes. Now what's interesting about Trinidad is the, 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 the earth itself, the flora and fauna of Trinidad does not resemble a Caribbean island. The flora and the fauna of Trinidad specifically and the land the rock formations specifically look like South America. And I'm hypothesizing that Trinidad does not only have oil and gas, they do not only have these uh, precious stones that they know about, but I'm hypothesizing that Trinidad may potentially have gold, 
silver and other precious metals and quite possibly diamonds it's possible okay when we look at when we look at the actual formation of the land and what contributes the tributaries coming out of South America and I believe those tributaries they are pushing literally I believe this and I want to show you something they are pushing some of these precious metals out of South America down the Orinoco and towards Trinidad okay now what I want to show you is I saw this and I'm like hmm so what I'm thinking is this in the north it's going to be mining from the sand in the south I think it's going to be under sea exploration for gold okay And I think, I think that that Gulf of Paria, this is my hypothesis. It's a hypothesis and I'm stressing it's a hypothesis because I'm studying and I know how they think. You invented the iPod and the Kindle. Listen, I get it all the time. You don't have the brain capacity to me, 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 me. That's why I'm stressing. This is a hypothesis. This is just my theory and my conjecture. Okay? Because I know how the experts think. And I know that the experts are going to take one look at me and laugh me to scorn. Because I don't know the science behind geology. Okay? I don't know the science behind gold mining. I don't. So they're going to look at me and they'll laugh me off the planet. But I'm accustomed to being laughed at, you know. It, you, have to get, you have to have a lot of balls when you come forward and you say you vented the iPod and the Kindle and it was stolen. And I haven't changed my mind. And every day I get laughed at, mocked, and dragged through the mud. Whatever. So, if I dare to dream of the iPod and the Kindle, I'm daring to dream again. And I'm thinking, this is what I'm thinking. That Gulf of Paria and the bottom of Trinidad. Hear me? That Gulf of Paria the bottom of Trinidad, specifically that water, that water bridge, okay, between Venezuela, between the South American Trinidad, that, that stretch of water, and the northern mountain ranges in Trinidad has gold, or they have gold. They have other precious stones, and they have other precious metals. World's first seabed gold copper silver mine to begin production in 2019. Can Canada's Nautilus Minerals, one of the world's first seafloor miners, is on track to start operations at its Solwara or Solwara, one gold, copper and silver project off the coast of Papua New Guinea. Papua, Papua Guinea. In early 2019, the Toronto-based company, which is also developing another underwater sea pro project off the coast of Mexico, expects to have all its undersea mining tools ready to go by mid next year so it can kick off operations at the Bismarck Sea Base project shortly after. So I am hypothesizing that that Orinoco belt in Venezuela is pushing a vast amount of gold through those tributaries and there's a buildup of gold at the bottom of Trinidad 
around Trinidad, Gulf of Paria, because when we looked, when we looked, I closed it out. When we looked, we saw that that Orinoco flow literally engulfs the whole island of Trinidad. That is why when tourists go to Trinidad, they go, wait, hold on, how come your water is like 10 different colors? And they like, is it dirty? No, that's the Orinoco Delta. Because we're a South American country, we're right where that Orinoco Delta comes out of. So I'm thinking the south of Trinidad, the Gulf of Paria to the west, and that northern range has gold. And I'm thinking and I'm wondering if the vast majority of it is not at the base of Trinidad. Now, again, this is a hypothesis. You're not going to spend the kinds of money that you're going to spend to launch a kind of operation like this and you know the next thing you know you come up with nothing you know again this is just my hypothesis right so that was what I wanted to show you I spoke about the mud volcanoes yep I spoke about that yep I spoke about that and I spoke about that so that's my hypothesis tell me what you think and no I'm not interested in um, what I'm making this video because it's my theory and historically the crooks they rush to invest the money in my work and then leave me in the dust so if you hear that they have discovered gold and silver and diamonds and other precious stones and metals in Trinidad, I need the world to know that it is my theory. I've had this hunch since 2015 and I decided to move forward with it, okay? Um, so I'm making this video to um, let the world know that it's my hunch. What I will do is I will write a case statement for my hypothesis and I will put all this information in there in a case statement. I am not interested, I am in no way interested in excavation or exploration. It's just not safe when you do it as an individual. But I think there is potential there, there is potential there, and I think there's something there. Finally, there's one thing I wanted to show you before I go. The, the pitch lake. One thing to show you before I go. Okay. Okay. Now This is um, Sir Walter Raleigh. Okay, so this is the history of the Pitch Lake in Trinidad. What I find interesting, and I was wondering if the Pitch Lake is not another source for gold deposits or silver, or maybe copper, iron, or something like that. Something is telling me that the pitch lake is another source, but I can't find any scientific research that says, you know, they've, they've done excavations and they discovered that pitch lakes tend to have, you know, some precious stones or metals or whatever. But another hunch of mine is telling me these pitch lakes are another, re another region in the world that has natural natural um, uh, precious metals and precious stones right okay so it's got them from okay Trinidad Pitch Lake located beside the village of La Bray, offers visitors a unique opportunity to experience the world's largest natural deposits of asphalt that's not what I wanted to tell you Look at this, Calafaria. 
that's interesting. Calafaria. This is there was a queen called Califia in where you get your name California. In um, that's interesting. That's that's it. She must have been. Uh, let me see. Kasaka, the prince of the rival Kumana tribe. Hey, Calafaria. That's really interesting. Anyway, whatever. Okay, so 1595. So Walter Raleigh arrived in Trinidad in search of El Dorado, the fabled city of gold. The bastard and criminal cartel post Columbus attacked Port of Spain with cannons, sacked St. Joseph because he was a criminal. While sailing across the Gulf of Paria, he reputedly smelled the tar and put into shore at Terra de Brea. The Caribs, my ancestors, led Raleigh to the pitch lake and he realized that the substance was ideal for corking his ships. He took several barrels home with him and has since been credited with discovering. How the hell are you going to put the caroms, took you to the pitch lake, and then you discovered it? These people, I don't know who the hell writes these things. How the hell does someone take you to somewhere and you discover it? Am I the only one that... I can't. How does someone take you somewhere and you this whatever that's for another day so the post columbian criminal cartel so walter raleigh was in search of el dorado okay he was in search of el dorado okay and then he got credited with um discovering the bitch league I don't know who the hell writes these history books, but whatever. How the hell do you discover something when someone took your dumb ass there? Whatever. I can't allow myself to get pissed. Anyway, so that's what I wanted to... Um, but this is interesting. Look at this. Legends about the pitch league. One leg local legend involved Califaria. That's interesting. Her name was Califaria because California was named after... An indigenous woman whose name was Queen Califia, daughter of the local tribal chief who fled her lover, Kasaka, a prince of the rival Kumana tribe. That's something? Califaria. Hmm? Okay, whatever. So, that's what I wanted to show you. Anyway, you have to excuse me. Who the hell carries someone somewhere and you discover it? Who writes this stuff? Anyway, so that's my hypothesis. Alright, tell me what you think. Thanks.